It's a beautiful morning. It's been so sunny and bright, and able to sit outside and consider what God has been doing for us. I wanted to show you this. That's back in April. I was privileged to visit and attend this little seminar called Seeds Church and Church Revitalization, and. Um, there's some powerful things going on. But they gave us a handout there. Oh, here's the speakers. You got Raquel Gilliam, Stuart, Errol, Jeff, and Potts. But there was something rather astounding that they passed out just in the front, just as we got started. And there's a quote from it. It's probably no surprise to you that many of the churches of our conference are either plateaued or dying. According to Tom Rayner, 90% of the churches in Christendom are either in decline or growing at a pace slower than their community. In the Kentucky, Tennessee conference, roughly 33% of our 110 churches have fewer than 30 attending members on Sabbath morning. I think we make that count here, right? Many of our medium and larger churches are struggling as well. We care about our struggling churches and are willing to provide coaching, training, and resources to help you grow. There are two levels of assistance that we can offer to our churches. And they go on to go through you know, some very inspirational things. In this continent of North America, 6% of the global distribution of Adventist believers are in North America. The large percentage of Adventists live, where do you think? Africa. But that does not include Northern Africa, where the Arab countries are, going from Morocco all the way to Egypt, and including part of, uh, even part of, of uh, Turkey. So that is a very sobering thought. I thought I had that map up there. But what, what it meant to me was that there's some serious inter personal inventory that has to be done in order to continue this Christian walk and to really self-examine where I stand in the Lord. Um, their encouragement was pray, have a personal relationship with Christ, and come together as a community of believers and increase your, your uh, participation. And I'll say, say that, all that to say this, that uh, making changes, making changes. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to make changes? Any ideas? Why is it hard? We're programming our brain. We've got a habit, right? It's hard to break a habit. I think uh, that was mentioned in our Sabbath school. Some of the hardest addictions that I can think of was chemical addictions that I was witness to when I was working as uh, working with uh, rescue missions down in Miami and also in Washington, D.C., where we have men and women who are addicted to either alcohol or crack cocaine. And breaking a habit is really, really hard. And it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to move you away from what you were dependent upon into a new life, completely changed. And some things, there are times, sometimes the Lord comes to you and says, okay, Brad, I got something I have to do with you. Um, and it was really hard. Uh, and I had to ask, what, what are some of the things I'm holding on to? I love cheese. I love cheese. Um, I, how do I give it up? How did I give it up? Prayer, embrace of God, and then some powerful information was, exposed, was given to me. I knew I had to be absolutely convinced that cheese was not only bad for me, but that it would kill me unless I stopped putting cheddar 
into my mouth. So two reality checks slapped me in the face. Two reality checks. First off, my cholesterol was sky high. And second, Brother Walter Bythe, you may have heard him, he has an amazing lecture that's available online called Utterly Amazing, with a D, Utterly Amazing. Can you guess what it was about? Cheese and milk. <laughs> they expose the deplorable conditions of dairy husbandry and sickening process of making cheese. I turned my stomach and I thought, well, Lord, maybe this is time. What would I do? What should I do? What would you do? Continue to consume gobs of my favorite comfort food, mac and cheese? Or uh, make a change? Truly consider my ways, count the cost. What do you think happened? What do you think happened? <laughs> yeah, huh? gave up the cheese, the dairy cheese. Now I must admit they make some pretty tasty mock cheese made by Daya that can go a long way to satisfy the cheese craving. But nonetheless, dairy is gone from my life. You know, uh, that was a hard change. Uh, there are lots of hard changes when the Lord confronts you that we must make because if we don't, there may be some disastrous effects coming upon us. Let's go to Haggai. Haggai, as it's pronounced in the Hebrew. Haggai, chapter 1. Now, we don't know much about Haggai, except what he says in his letter here, his, his uh, sermons. Uh, Haggai is very small. It's divided into four sermons that he makes on separate occasions as Israel progresses in their maturity. He and Zechariah and Malachi were contemporaries, hence they're at the last end of your Old Testament. Remember, Malachi, Zechariah, and Haggai were together with the remnant Israel that came from captivity from where? Where did they come from when out of captivity? Babylon. Well, in this case, at this time, they were in Cyrus. They were in Medo-Persia, the same land, but it had changed hands over. And Cyrus the Great had given them a decree in 538 BC. And at that time, the remnant had come back. Ezra and Nehemiah were working very hard and getting things done. They had the money. They were even given salt, we read, to rebuild the walls. And they got a start. They got a kind of a jump start on the temple, but they got discouraged. They got discouraged. Uh, they were organizing to repair broken Jerusalem, but they, one of the discouragements was famine. There was pestilence in the land, and they had a lot of bad neighbors trying to discourage them. Can you, can you have you? <laughs> Israel had spent most of their efforts creating creature comforts for themselves. Cedar paneled walls and ceilings were favorite interior designs. And today, we're going to examine some of the glorious attributes of God, his mercy, his care, his patience with us as we read Haggai's message. Now, we can compare the dates of the Syrian calendars with the information given here in our Bible, and we understand that the date that he started this message was actually August 29, August 29, 520 B.C. And we read, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it 
and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So please take a look at the question very seriously. Just as Zerubbabel, Joshua, and uh, all the people did at that time. Is it time? The SDA commentary has a comment here that says, the Israelites had no real excuse for leaving their work on the temple. The time when the most serious objections were raised was a time for them to persevere in building, but they were actuated by a selfish dislike to encounter danger by arousing the opposition of their enemies. Did you hear that? They had no excuse. What was the cause of their leisure? What does it say? Selfishness. Selfishness puts holes in your pockets. According to what we just read, and when you're at ease, what goes in your pockets falls right out. Listen to what this question again. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lay desolate? Now, there may be some of us who are wondering why we can't pay the bills or the hot water just blew, the hot water heater just blew. But God is saying to us, consider your ways. Now I want you to contrast post-exile Israel's attitude. This is, before, this is before they were taken in captivity. This is while David's and Solomon's kingdom were at their peak. And we find in 2 Samuel 7, 2, David says, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth in curtains. David's heart hurt when he compared God's humble tent with his royal house of cedar. He was living in a sealed house, but it really bothered him. Now, years later, God confronts the son of David here in, this, in Haggai, through the prophet Haggai, and says, is it time? And he's asking this in the negative. He's, he's saying, you say it's time to relax, but God says, really? Really? Is it time to relax? Is it time? Is it time to dwell in comfort while my house, my temple, lies waste? Now here's another question presented by the Apostle Paul. Know you not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's 1 Corinthians 3.16. Haggai's brief and piercing message cut right to the heart of the issue. Israel did not have a church issue. They had a sin issue. The disrepair of the Lord's temple was a telling tale of the total unkempt condition of their heart, their soul, and their lifestyle. The Review and Herald, we find, in neglecting the temple, which was the mirror of God's presence, the people had greatly dishonored God. They were now instructed to hold his house in sacred honor, not because of its magnificence, as did the Jews in the days of Christ, but because God had promised to be there. And this second temple was to be superior to the first because in a special sense, the Messiah would honor it with his personal presence. Quote, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the lawgiver from the beneath of feet, his feet until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That was published in December 12, 1907. When Jesus arrived at the temple, what did he see and what did he do? What did Jesus see and what did Jesus do when he arrived at the temple? The first and the second time, by the way. What did he see? Money changers? Money changers, really? Why would they be changing money? Trading and selling. Now, we've heard before a few weeks past that the reason they traded and sell is because they would not take Gentile money in the temple. So they had to trade Roman money for the temple currency. So in, when you make currency exchanges, you make a profit, usually two, three, four, sometimes 5%. So they were really dishonest in dealing there right on the temple grounds. So what did he do? 
Yeah? He had a special way of getting them out, didn't he? What did he take? He whipped them out, says my mother-in-law. Yes. Whipped them out. And the, and the tables didn't stay upright, did they? They got turned over. There was a to and his presence, we read in, in the Spirit of Prophecy, his presence was so magnificent. It glowed such brilliance that no one could stop this cleansing of the temple. He had a whip, and I'm sure somebody got hit. But we don't know for sure. He showed his anger at hypocrisy and greed. He did. Jesus went into the temple and cast, here, here it is in, in Matthew 21, 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, why is that so significant? Why did he target the doves? What do you think? When you brought a sacrifice to an animal to sacrifice for sin, what were some of the animals that were available for you to give an offering? What? Doves are one of them. What about the others? A lamb. You, and if you're really rich, you could bring a whole heifer. So a dove was really represented the poorest of the poor. You see why Jesus went after the dove sellers? He was after those dishonest men who were bilking the poor and making a profit off of them. And he said to them, is it written? It, no, he said, it is written. My house shall be called the house of But ye have made it a den of. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Hallelujah, right. When the power of God comes in, things change. Now, he may have to knock over a few things and make a change in the heart and reveal to you the dishonesty ooh, or the um, covetousness that you have. Question. If you're in the temple of God, what's happening inside here? What's going on? No, no, don't answer yet. Just think. When Jesus saw the money and the commerce, what did he do? He preached from just two scriptures. Two of them. The most powerful sermon you've probably ever heard because it made difference in everyone's life because we see here the, the, what was it? The lame and the blind came. Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 12. That's it. Is our heart a living room of thieves? Thieves of time, thieves of space, thieves of busyness? Or is our house, our temple, a place of prayer, a place of purpose, a place of power? And I must make this personal. Am I robbing God of his time, his space, with too much noise and commerce? I know I have a long way to go, but my path is on Progress Street. Amen. I have cut the cable of confusion on Peyton Place and the noise of nuisance on Commerce Court. K-Love is no longer part of my drive time on the road, and I'm bound for the promised land, and I intend to bring as many people along the highway of holiness right to Jesus Street. Amen. Hallelujah. So please remember, we are not called to dwell. We are mandated to tell. So what should I, or what should my walk tell the world? What would happen if we continued to put our feet up on this sofa? Please. So, as our prophet says today, consider your ways. Someone give another word for consider. Any ideas? A word for consider. The English language is very complex, but, it, but at the same time, it's very simple. Think about it. Yeah, good. What else? How do you think about it? Thoughtfully. What's another word for consider? Examine. Examine. 
Our, our dictionary says to think about carefully huh? and to think especially with regard to some action. You get it, that? When God says, consider your ways, what's he saying to us? Think and make a change. Uh -huh. Think and make a change. So the word consider involves both care. Did we hear that? Care and action. And it's an exercise of this thinking matter up here that causes us to move. Very well, then. Let's a little get more serious here. Listen to Pastor Jeremiah as he lamented Israel's sad estate on the penitent road of exile way. As we turn to Lamentations 3.37, you can go there if you wish. I'm going to give you two translations that help paint a broader picture of the same verse in two different English versions. First, of you, uh, first I'm coming from Lamentations 3.37-40 through 40 in the King James Version. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good? That's a question. 39. Wherefore doth a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways, and turn again to the Lord. Here again we see both care and action. Turn and try. So let's get to a little personal here and listen to what the New Living Translation has to say with the same verse. You ready? Here, here it goes. Who can command things? This is verse 37. Okay. This is how they render this verse. Verse 37. Who can command things to happen without the Lord's permission? Mm. Does not the Most High send both cal calamity and good? then why should we as mere humans complain when we are punished for our sins? Instead, let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord. That's Jeremiah's heart and soul being poured out to us, to me, this morning. Let's sink in a moment. So if I understand this verse correctly, nothing happens without God's permission. Huh? Nothing happens without God's permission. Nothing. I'm both amused and disturbed when I hear folks say they had a bad day. I think uh, Israel here, under the watch care of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, thought they might be having a bad day. It says in Haggai, you have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled. You drink and are filled with drink. You, I, you clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Were they having a bad day? <laughs> they worked hard all day on the streets of vanity and had nothing to show for it. What they consumed never satisfied their thirst for lust. They hid themselves in a cloak of deceit and were never warm. On top of that, all their investments in the stock of ease went down the drain. So what right do you or I have to complain? Especially if you find yourself in the same path. Who was to blame? for all these things, all these bad things? Let's read in verse 9, the same chapter. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. This is verse 9 of Haggai, chapter 1. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. Hmm. Did you hear that? God said, I did blow. Please, dear family, we dishonor God when we give the devil credit for our trials. I hear too often things like, the devil's making, is attacking me. But it was God all the time, knocking on the doorposts of our heart, trying to get our attention and making every effort to save us from ourselves and from perishing forever. 
That sounds like the breeze of love, a still small voice, and not the pitiful howling tempest of the deceiver. God is saying here in Scripture, examine our ways, test our ways, consider our ways, see the condition of the temple, your heart, my heart, and look very hard at all of your running to your own house down the path of busyness. If I run so hard for myself, Lord, please blow on me. Please, Lord, blow on me. Please, Lord, blow on me. Do you want to hear from a heart that ran after God? Then listen just to a moment to David's. In David's heart was a deep passion to build a temple for his God, but God said, no. Your son Solomon will build it instead. What was David's response to such a rejection? Let's hear it. We read in 2 Samuel 7, 18, then the king David, then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? O oh, to have a heart like David. Who am I, O Lord God? Somehow David was able to see higher than the sealed tiles of a glorious temple. Instead, he saw Jesus, the promised Messiah, the desire of all nations. David did not build. He gathered. All his efforts were for someone else. Mm. All his joy was poured out into preparing for the one to come after him. Listen to David's exhortation to his son Solomon, who would soon follow in his steps and build the temple. And we find in 1 Chronicles 28, verses 9 and 10. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts. Did you hear that? All hearts. And understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if, you, if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Verse 10. Take heed now. Take heed now. For the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Notice. What is David's exhortation to Solomon, his son? What's the most important thing it was for his son to complete this heavenly project? What do you think it was? Get all the things together and get all the technicians and engineers to put the temple together to glorify God. What, what, what do you think it was the most important thing, according to what we just read? What was the most important thing? Huh? To what? A heart toward Christ, to know him, that's it, to know the king of heaven. It no longer was about a sealed house, it was about the presence of a holy and awesome God, a powerful king of the universe. It was about having a personal and intimate relationship of the owner of the house, Christ, the anointed one himself. That's what it was about. We don't build things, we don't put this building up just to make it look good. It looks pretty sharp. May need a little fixing up here and there, but it's still standing. What's the purpose of this house? Oh yeah? Are we doing it? Are we doing it? I don't know about you, dear family. I want this temple full of the presence of God. Who is to blame for all our hardships? as we sit on our sofa of ease. Who is to blame? You know, um, the dear folks at this convention that I shared with you, 
had a question. He asked, these were pastors and elders. Why are you going to church in the first place? What business do you have there? So what? So you're holding service every Sabbath. Really had to ask true motivation of why we do what we do. That's why we consider our ways. Who's to blame? I have to start with me. We read in Deuteronomy 8, 5, so, th so thou shalt, this is Deuteronomy 8, verse 5 and 6. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. To fear him. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief there is no relief, though my tears flow all night long? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he began with what? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yes, the king of the universe will be addressed as our Father. Yes, our Father will take a firm hand at times on our backside to remind us of his love for us that was there all the time. It is with deep devotion to my Father that I yearn to keep his commandments. Do you love the Father? Hmm? Consider your ways. So says the Lord through his prophet. Have you done this lately? When was the last time you took a stern look into the mirror of truth and stepped onto the scales of honesty? You ever done that? look in the mirror and sit on the scale. When I look at the scale, I don't like what I see. When I look in the mirror, what do I see? A lot of imperfections. An old gray man, almost 69 years old. But is that what Jesus sees? Hmm? He sees my heart. He sees the heart. And he asked me to look in the mirror of honesty and consider my ways. I've had to do that a couple other times. It wasn't just cheese. Back in the day, almost seven years ago, a little almost over seven years ago, you see, I've been a Sunday keeper all my Christian walk, almost 40 years. And um, there were two wondrous things happened. The last two churches my wife and I joined, one was in Silver Spring, Maryland, the other was near San Antonio, Texas. And um, both pastors were removed, both by abrupt and very emotional separations, resignations. They were, I, we were stunned. We had no clue. We I, were asking ourselves, is this the way Christians conduct church? You know, in the temple of the Lord, no less. Pa imagine that pastors reading the resignation in front of the pulpit. It, I had to really, you know, it shocked me. And then another amazing thing happened. My stepson got amazingly saved while he was in jail. But that wasn't the miracle. He began to pester me with questions because he became on fire. He wanted to study the Word of God, and he pestered me with these questions. Uh, what about the Sabbath? Oh, you know, I could give him a typical answer that I always used to give for those 40 years, but it puzzled me. I had, it was like a buzz in my ear, like a, you know, like a mosquito that wouldn't go away. You, you, know, to, you know. He asked me, who changed the Sabbath? Uh, Okay, Lord, two pastors forced to resign. Now this worship thing. What's going on? 
what's going on? Have you been there? Have, have you been confronted with something that you were positive, you knew you were correct? Like Paul going down the road to Damascus? Huh? You're absolutely convinced that this was the will of God. And all of a sudden, we're forced to consider over 40 years of church growing tradition. How could I be so wrong? What was it that brought me to my senses? You know, it was the best place you can be. Where do you think it was? When your heart is troubled like this, where did I go? On the knees and into the Word. So in my devotional time, I was initially reading Matthew chapter 19 again. I'd read it, I don't know how many times before. And look here, it's chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Sounds like a good question, huh? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. It was hit me like a ton of bricks. What? Tut? I've never seen it before, but yet I read it so many times. You mean all ten? How is it possible? So I furiously went through all the cross references I could find. I went to Leviticus 19. I went to Deuteronomy 5. I went to all the Gospels. I went to Genesis chapter 2, no less. It's probably the best reinforcement of any Sabbath keeper. Genesis chapter 2, 2. And what, did, what does God say there? He rested, he blessed it, and he sanctified it. Whew. I couldn't get past that. But it's really hard to change when you've been doing something for so long. So I wasn't totally convinced yet. I was, it, was a, it was a plant in my head, in my heart. And I said, okay, God, there must be some confirmation somewhere. And my dear wife, bless her heart, I know she loves me, <laughs> Cause, uh, and I love her. And they, she gets very clever. She, uh, she recommended listening to Professor Walter Weiss's um, series on, on science. Because I looked it up, and I knew, oh, this guy, is a, this guy is a conspiracy theorist. All he talks about is conspiracies and all this stuff. <laughs> but, he, but she knew I liked science. Especially creation science, you know, and, and you know, all these things. And if, if you get a chance, go look them up. It's, it's free online. Very, very good. But he has this troubling seventh lecture. You know what it was called? A day to be remembered. The seventh day. And I said, oh, wow. That's why the seventh day was made? It was for... Me and you, God, as for us to commune together. Ah, oh, it was such a relief. I fell in with Jesus all over again. It was right there in plain sight. The seventh day was created. He didn't need did he make he did he didn't need to make a seventh day. He was finished, right? So the seventh day had to be special. So why do we change it? I, I don't know. It was created for us, dear family. But that wasn't the only thing I had to confront after being a Sunday keeper. I had to, I had to consider one more thing. Who do you think it was? Huh? Ellen White. Now, we were taught from small that this occult writer had no place in an honest Christian home. No place! The first time I was forced to consider, I went to the Adventist Book Center and to receive some Bible supplies. Because on a Sunday, and they were the only ones open. <laughs> so when I went back the following week, on a Saturday, I was put off. It was how rude. Don't they know I need Sunday school supplies? And when I went in the store, they had this bookshelf full of this writer's writings. And I kind of went, okay. That's something else. 
But the Lord has amazing patience, you know. He, he has a way of reminding you how silly you are. Because he reminded me, he says, it came out something like this. Brad, you know, you, you enjoy reading other devotional writers. Uh, God is saying something like, you know, I caught you write, uh, reading Tozer and Spurgeon and Flavel and all those other reformers. Have you ever read Ellen White? Uh, you know, <laughs> no. No, I haven't. So what do you think I, first copy I picked up was The Great Controversy. Wow. The brush of history just swept through my heart. And of course, you know what the end of it says. The last scripture she quotes is God is love. God is love indeed. And love indeed. Listen to Psalm 119, 59. I thought on my ways. This is 119, 59 and 60. I thought on my ways and turned my feet into thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I did not, I could not delay running into the arms of a loving God whose only plea to me was, if you love me, keep my commandments. Wow. My pride had to melt in the heat of God's light. Again, we read in Romans 12, 3, For I say, though the, through the grace given me to every man that is among you, do not think himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Oh, yes, I know he cares. He put up with me for so long. He's still putting up with me. And after Jesus finished giving these choice words to this rich young man, we find in Mark 10, 21, then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, what, how many things? One thing, one thing thou lackest. Go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. Take up the cross and follow me. Leave your traditions behind. Leave your old habits behind and follow me. Is it an easy way to follow Jesus? Where did he go? He went up the road, the Via de la Rosa. God's way is not my way. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of. You see how God can deal with you as he, this is how he dealt with me. But whose way should we follow? What did Jesus say to Thomas? Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come with the Father but by me. Consider your ways. So we understand that there is really only one way. That's the Jesus way. The only way. And I had to be willing to admit how wrong I am. I need the Lord to show me how to treat my wife better. I need the Lord to show me how to treat you better. To leave my selfishness behind, my pride over here. Oh, it's so hard, but worth it all. Go back to Haggai, in verse 8 we read, these stirring solutions to this issue. Because the Lord doesn't just give you a command. He gives you steps. One, two, three. And we see that in verse 8, Haggai chapter 1. Can you see that now? Let's re-examine this verse again. 
He says, now watch it. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the house. And what's the result? I will take pleasure in it and will be glorified. I love God. <laughs> Whenever he gives you a quiz, he gives you an open book test. And it was there, right there in front of me all the time. It was right there. It was right there. It was right there. So let's look at this for a while. For before we build anything, we must, we must go up higher. We cannot afford to remain where we are now. You know what that means? That means we got to leave something behind if we're going up. Up yonder is life and life everlasting. Go that way. Go up the mountain. Oh, it may be a rough road. It's not easy, is it? Now, when you try to run uphill, what happens to the body? Dr. Magus, when you start running up the hill, what happens? Huh? <laughs> you start breathing hard, and your heart pumps hard, right? So is it easy going up the hill? So how do you know you're going up? Your body tells you it's either you need to better get in better shape or just to keep on going, right? Just to keep on going. So there's a physical law in action here. It's called gravity. It's called gravity. And it's not supposed to be easy, friends. Oh, but going up makes us stronger. So go up higher and higher. Listen to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord and from Jerusalem. Do you hear that? The law and the word of the Lord. His law is immutable, unchangeable, and it stands today. His law of, is perfect, changing the soul. The second part. All right, so we're going up this mountain, right? What do we do? We go, do we go up empty-handed? What does the verse say? Bring wood. Bring wood. That's what the Lord is challenging us to go. Bring up, go up higher and bring wood. So what kind of wood should we bring? Think about it for a moment. Now, the temple in Solomon's time was made up of two main components. What were they? Huh? They're made up of what? Rock. Oh, that's another important part. But basically, that was the, that was the trim. But the, but the structural, from an engineer's point of view, would be rock and wood. Because the inside of the temple was was, first off, it was paneled with what? Cedar. Mm, think about that. Not just any rock will do, though. It must be the best marble quarried from the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It must be the best wood hewn from the best and fragrant cedar forest of Lebanon. Bring only your best wood to the Lord. Come with your arms full of the most fragrant wood you can offer. A broken and contrite heart. We must go up Moriah's way and carry wood more precious than cedar. Oh, consider how Abraham himself laid the wood of pride upon the shoulders of his only beloved son, Isaac. His only beloved son, the son of his old age, as he trod up the hill of sacrifice. Now in the Hebrew, these words consider, that we've been reading in Haggai, and laid in this verse, is the same one. In the Hebrew, they pronounce it sum. So we can learn a little bit more about what, Abraham, what was going through Abraham's mind as he walked the way 
of Moriah. He was forced to, to, as as he went up, Abraham had to ponder the destruction of his own flesh and blood each step of the way. He was forced to consider his selfish ways as he ascended the Mount of Mourning to Moriah, the chosen of Jehovah. Are you, am I, able to do the same? What do you think Jesus meant when he challenges us to do the same thing as found in Matthew 16, 24? Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And what? What wood would you bring to his temple? Can it be any less and the cross of Christ, will you take up the cross? Up the hill of Golgotha, the place of the skull? And finally, we are to do something. We are to build the house. Not only are we to go up higher and to bring our best wood, we must take action and build the house. If your body is a temple of God, we must take sacred and silent action, just like the builders of the temple. Not a sound was heard during the construction of the temple. And God wants, he yearns for that silent breaking of our heart so he can build us a temple of praise and glory. This is God's great desire for you and for me. And then we find the outcome in this simple verse. He will take pleasure and he'll be glorified. He will see what is done, the work of miracle working effect in our hearts as a change, and his name will be elevated above all creation and all the heavens and the earth. We read in this account that God himself stirred the spirit of the remnant Israel to take action at once. I encourage you to go back and read this very brief chapter of Haggai. It's very, very brief. But we find in this testimony one of the most astounding changes. He is considered one of the most successful prophets in the word of God because we see a distinct change in the people. They cried on their faces before the Lord and they put and invested. In the face of danger, they invested and put the temple back together again. You see there? Can you see that? I'm reminded also of Ezra's sermon at the water gate in Jerusalem that Nehemiah records in chapter 8. That's another sermon. We will take pleasure and be glorified. We see there that he, God himself stirred the spirit of the remnant Israel to take action. For what purpose and to what end did they begin? What was the purpose? To glorify God to please God and to glorify him. We must consider our ways and do the same. If we build for any other cause, it is in vain. So, as it says in the word, be strong. Witness another glorious attribute of God. After a fatherly reproof comes the voice of encouragement. Once an honest ascent up the hill of repentance and reformation begins, God delivers to us today an astounding promise. Listen to the words of Haggai the prophet once more as God encourages Zerubbabel and the nation of all Israel to complete their task with zeal. He says in verse 4 of chapter 2, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the Lord saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. Fear ye not, saith the Lord. Do you hear that? God is reminding us of his covenant promise. From Mount Moriah, to Mount Sinai, to Mount Calvary. God is encouraging the broken and repentant ones to be strong, work, and work hard for God, for God is with us. Is he not Emmanuel, God with us? 
Is he not the Savior of all nations? What says the Lord again in, in verse 7? And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill his house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. You see here what Haggai saw the future. He saw the future hope of the first advent of Christ, the desire of all nations, in whom will the Lord be glorified? By whose hand are you going to make ready, made a temple of the living God? By whose hand? Christians, consider these words. Christians are Christ's jewels. They are to shine brightly for him, shedding forth the light of his loveliness. Their luster departs, excuse me, their luster depends on the polishing they receive. They may choose to be polished or remain unpolished. But everyone who is pronounced worthy of a place in the Lord's temple must submit to the polishing pro uh, process. Without the polishing that the Lord gives, they can reflect no more light than a common pebble. Christ says to man, you are mine, I have bought you. You are now only a rough stone, but if you will place yourself in my hands, I will polish you, and the luster with which you shall shine will bring honor to my name. No man shall pluck you out of my hand. I will make you a peculiar treasure. On my coronation day, you will be a jewel in my crown of rejoicing. That's seen in Review and Herald, December 19, 1907. Is it time? Allow me to ask you, are you living in a sealed house today? Is it time? There's too much at stake to stay where you are. Time is too short. Jesus will return soon and claim his crown. Will you be his crown of rejoicing? Will you place yourself in God's hands? Can he make you? He'll first, he'll break you and then he'll make you into something glorious. That's his desire. If you do, God will not only place you among his jewels, he will make you into a temple fit for a king. Amen. But let me read to you the first stanza of this hymn. It's very penetrating. And perhaps you yourself will consider your ways. It reads, this is 209, I'm reading. We have not known thee as we ought, nor learned thy wisdom, grace, and power. The things on earth have filled our thoughts, the trifles of the passing hour. Lord, give us light, thy truth to see, and make us wise in knowing thee. We have not feared thee as we ought, nor bowed beneath thy awful eye, nor guarded deed and word and thought, remembering that God was nigh. Lord, give us faith to know thee near, and grant us the grace of holy fear. Our Father in heaven, Thank you for your patience with me and with us. You've been with me all these years and brought me to a place, oh God, where you challenge me again and again to consider my ways. Forgive us, Lord, of our dishonesty, our cruelty, the grudges we keep. Break our hearts anew and afresh. Let us, O oh God, follow you and bring glory and honor to your name. Who else, who else is there but you? You are the one, O oh Lord, that has eternal life. O oh dear Lord, why do I hang on to these things, these things that will perish? Oh, to see you, to see you high and lifted up, as Isaiah saw, the train filled the temple, Lord, help your people. Help us, O oh God, and bring the coals from off the altar. And burn our lips and our heart with the truth, with life, 
everlasting, that we may be good neighbors to those around us as we pray in Jesus' name.